first this issue of oral and then writing. Uh, the reality is, is that writing or literacy and oral tradition coexist, and they coexist and have coexisted in large parts of, of the world for centuries. Recent studies that have been made in Africa and in other places have shown that many societies are producing oral literature and written literature at exactly the same time. And in fact, not only does that happen, but there is an, a relationship between the written and the oral. The writing sometimes is actually uh, a support for oral performance. In fact, um, most of the oral tradition that's been collected by scholars throughout the last couple of centuries was not collected from illiterate societies. Uh, nor are literate societies just the home of written text. The largest majority of samples we have of oral tradition, of stories passed on in oral tradition, have come out of societies that knew how to write. Uh, either was, was recent, but they continued to perform oral stories, but quite often where societies had been literates, but continued to uh, pass on receive their literature orally. A couple of examples. In Japan, this is a culture that's been literate for many centuries, but the epics of Japan are recited. They're not read. You don't buy a copy of, of the Japanese uh, epics like the Nihongi and, and others. These are performed and people expect to receive them or encounter them in a performed setting. In uh, Bali, there's a lot of evidence. This is a society that has become uh, literate only um, in, in a, well, not recently, but in more recent centuries. Uh, but again, it has only served to revitalize the oral tradition. And there's a constant interplay between stories that are written down, performed orally, the oral performance changes the story somewhat, then someone writes down the new version, and then that one gets performed again. So the story moves in and out of oral and written media. In uh, Nepal, when the great Hindu epics like the Ramayana are um, performed, there are many written versions in a multiple different languages that one can find. And um, then there are oral versions that do not correspond to any written version that one might find, both of which are handed down from generation to generation. And again, without the one getting rid of the other. The same thing seems to be true for the ancient world. And here we can rely on archaeology to provide some of the evidence. Uh, first of all, Egypt. In ancient Egypt, this is a very early literate society. And uh, in a number of the royal burial suites, we have texts written on the walls. They call them the pyramid texts. Many of them begin with the phrase Jed Madu, which means to be recited, not to be read off the wall. The whole thing that's written is meant to be recited out loud. We also have uh, practice copies of texts, texts that were handed around, that circulated, that have been found in the ruins of cities. And many of these have, in addition to the hieroglyphic text, red markings that indicate raise your voice here, lower your voice, a little louder at this point, and how to perform. There really was no audience for reading in ancient Egypt. Uh, writing, uh, the only book that circulated as a book for which there was a market was the Book of the Dead. And the purpose of the Book of the Dead is to hang on a necklace around the body of a corpse. It's not something for anyone to read. <laughs> there was no market for books. The literature was oral. In ancient Iraq, ancient Babylon, many texts uh, that we have uncovered in cuneiform from the Sumerian period on uh, for over a thousand years, so down as late as uh, say 700 BC, texts are still marked anazimari, which means for singing. Uh, 
So this gives us a hint, in fact, that it's not even recitation. There's some other process going on. And in a moment, we'll come back to what singing might mean. There is a wonderful story that comes out of uh, the Assyrian world uh, around 700 BC that describes a, a person memorizing a text from writing the night before they're going to present it to the royal court. They're going to present it to the royal court from memory. They're doing that orally, it's being received orally, but it's been memorized from a written text the night before. The same is true in the, in the Greek period. And um, uh, whatever we mean by uh, Homer, for example, and there probably isn't one individual named Homer who composed the Iliad and the Odyssey, but those texts were texts that moved in and out of both oral and written uh, media for centuries. By the late 5th century BC, most upper class Athenians could read. This is the literate society of the ancient upper class freeborn Athenians could read. But they preferred and expected to encounter their literature orally. They weren't going to read uh, copies of Sophocles and, and uh, uh, Euripides and any of these things. They expected to hear these things orally. They expected to encounter them in some kind of community performance setting. Classical Latin texts also refer to their readers and listeners. Uh, and in fact, that, that phrase, lector et auditor, uh, it, it occurs on all sorts of Latin texts. These Latin texts presume that there are both readers and listeners. A very interesting um, uh, example of this occurs in the Christian New Testament at the very beginning of the last book of the Bible, um, uh, Revelation. It refers to the book's reader, singular, and hearers, plural. So the image is one person reading for others to hear. Judaism also, uh, the singing the laws, chanting the Torah, was the norm, uh, both in the early period, and we have a number of, of texts that talk about this, and on into the, to the Middle Ages. The Torah scrolls that were kept in a medieval synagogue are really um, a storage system, a backup memory. You've backed up the files onto the scroll, but you're supposed to sing them, you're supposed to know them by memory. Now, with that being the case in both much of the ancient world and modern societies, I can apply this to ancient Israel, which is the period that I'm interested in. And, and what I'm focusing on my book is roughly, let's say, 900 to 500 BC. We don't have a lot of evidence from there like we do from these other cultures. What we do have is evidence of literacy. Uh, literacy seems to have taken off in the 700s BC. And there are a number of pieces of evidence that one can put together to establish this, and that, that at the same time establish that if you go 200 years earlier, say 900, you're not looking at a very literate society. But beginning around uh, 800 BC, so the beginning of the, of the 8th century, you have a huge increase in the number of inscriptions that have been discovered archaeologically. You have a standardized seal that says, for the king, that was stamped on jars all the way throughout uh, the kingdom. You have writing that's coming not just, say, from one or two people, but coming from um, mid-ranking military officials. And to me, this is indicative of, of widespread literacy, when it's not just a professional class of scribe that might be able to read and write, but we have actually some texts from some uh, fortress commanders who say, I can read myself and I can write. I don't need a scribe to tell me what your letter says. So we've got field commanders who can read and write. We have landlords who can read and 